The next session is on a topic that definitely hits closer to our audience, creating better opportunities for young people. Ferle Miranda, a senior economist at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, will convene virtually. Uh, Ms. Miranda, the voice is over to you. Okay, very good. Yeah. So then I think we're all settled. Um, so it's um, my pleasure to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Of course, it's a, it's a pity I cannot be there physically. Uh, but I'm very glad that the virtual connection is working very well. So um, in the coming half an hour, I will entertain you with some uh, work, uh, the work we're doing here at the OECD on, um, on creating, uh, to create better opportunities for young people. And so uh, during this presentation, I will show you a range of um, youth labor market and social policy outcomes and also discuss uh, the policy options uh, that we can uh, present to you. So um, let's start with a key indicator on youth labor market outcomes. So that's the uh, youth unemployment rates. On average across the OECD uh, countries, as you can see in this uh, chart by the uh, red, red bar, um, across the OECD, the youth unemployment rate stood at 8.7% in 2023. Um, that is nearly double uh, the, the unemployment rate for the total population, which stood at 4.8% um, in 2023. Now, it is kind of normal that youth unemployment rates are higher. They're always higher, uh, even in good uh, economic, in times of, of economic growth, for example, because young people, they often have less work experience. They also have a more limited network to rely on their job search. But then on top, during economic downturns, um, we see that um, they have, they tend to have a much stronger impact on young people's uh, ability to both uh, find work, but also to stay in work because they're the first one to lose their jobs during an economic downturn because of they have temporary contracts or, for example, fewer company uh, specific skills. But also then there's additional individual characteristics, for example, low education or economic hardship. Also, migrant background is often a, an, an influence, uh, but also health and social problems. They can pose challenges for young people to stay and uh, remain in, an in employment. Now, another um, indicator that we frequently uh, use to measure the labor market performance of young people is what we call the NEED rate, which measures the share of young people who are not in an employment, education or training. And so these needs can either be unemployed, that means that they're without a job, but they're actually actively looking for a job. And then we have the inactive needs, who are young people who are not in employment, they're not in education, and they're not seeking uh, employment. They can be out of the labor market for a variety uh, of reasons. And so across the OECD, uh, as we see here in the red bar, there's about um, 13 percent of young people between 15 and 29 uh, years old who are not in employment education or training in 2023 and so these um, need rates stay very considerably across countries we have about five percent in the netherlands up to uh, almost 30 percent uh, in turkey now young people uh, some needs are voluntary needs uh, it's not a problem it can be a moment in life where you take a break but there's also many needs who are at risk to become socially excluded. Um, and so <clears throat> understanding their profiles of why they are in such a situation can help policymakers to design better policies and, and programs. And so to improve this uh, transition that young people go through from school to work in towards independence. And so on our website, because the OECD does a lot of work on, on this, um, in, on this uh, policy area, so on the website that I posted here on the slide, um, we have 20, uh, 12 country reviews, like the one I show here on Slovenia, where we provide a detailed assessment of uh, the country's um, policies, of a wide, wide range of policies, including skills, employment, but also social policies, and where we give specific recommendations for the country 
um, to improve their youth policies and improve the school um, to work transition. Now, one of the reasons why uh, young people uh, struggle in the labor market is because of low education. And low education, that obviously we define as not having an upper secondary diploma, and that is actually a very strong determinant of uh, weak labor market performance of young people. And so across the OECD, we see that 14% of 15 to 34 year olds do not have an uh, upper secondary education. Now, uh, looking at EU countries, the share is uh, a bit lower, but still there's 12% of young people who are uh, low educated. Now, this, this is really a policy area that should be a key focus for governments. Um, uh, it's not only the observation, but also to see why young people are actually leaving education early and how we can support them to uh, obtain um, uh, their diploma. And it's not only related to the quality or of the education system or the teachers, et cetera, but it's of course also very much related to a young person's own uh, circumstance, family uh, circumstance, household circumstances, et cetera. And so interventions often require collaboration between different stakeholders in different policy areas. Now, um, at the OECD, the OECD, um, every two years, we run a survey that we call um, Risk That Matter um, to look at uh, people's perceptions of uh, the social and economic risk they face. Um, we also look at how well they think that their government should address uh, is addressing those risks and what is their uh, preferences uh, for social protection going forward. And so this is a very interesting uh, survey that we use a lot um, to build our policy recommendations for government. And so um, this it's a cross-national survey um, that uh, is, has been undertaken now, it has been run uh, three, three times. It's nationally representative samples in over 25 OECD countries. And it, 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 it's really, um, it offers us very important insight, not only us, but also the governments who, or the countries who participate, very important insight in how we can um, reform um, and if needed, uh, expand social programs. Now, this survey, um, so we, we, we looked at the young, young people's answers to this survey. And so in, in this survey, there's one in seven uh, young people um, aged 18 to 29 uh, who responded to this survey that um, um, indicated um, that uh, they're unable to pay all expenses uh, in the short run as a top concern. So not being able to pay all the expenses is a key concern um, for uh, young people. And it is also a key concern for others but it is uh, uh, much more um, or more important uh, for young people than for older age groups. Um, when we look at the difference between uh, the older group and the younger group, we see that this age gap is most pronounced uh, when it comes to worries about um, not being able to find or maintain adequate housing. So we see that 64% of young people um, <coughs> are worried, are, are concerned about uh, not being able to find or maintain adequate housing. And that share is considerably higher than for the older uh, age groups. Now, on the other hand, looking at the other um, uh, policy areas, we see that young people are less concerned than older cohorts about becoming ill or disabled or not having uh, access to long-term uh, care for family members uh, or, for example, healthcare, and of course, that it's it's not it's not surprising. It's it also it very much shows that young people are typically um, less less they less they need less uh, healthcare uh, and also are less worried at, at, in that stage of their life about about ill health. Now, what we want to focus on, um, well, so of course, we also show that there's there's big differences uh, across across countries, right? So. Um, young people's concerns about uh, all these uh, various and social, uh, social and economic risks are higher, highest in um, countries like uh, Spain, Chile, Finland, um, yeah, uh, Spain, Chile, Mexico, Greece. Uh, and on the other hand, they're much, much lower, these worries in countries like Finland uh, or Estonia. 
Um, when we look at different age groups in, in this um, survey, we see that uh, women, uh, but also minorities and uh, young people who are not in education, employment or trading, uh, they tend to be much more concerned uh, than their peers, um, which actually accentuates that they already have other underlying vulnerabilities um, that, that might actually influence their concerns in this respect. So let's um, now turn to another uh, key measure uh, for young people's social uh, outcomes. Um, and so here in this figure, we're looking at the uh, poverty rate. So across the OECD, about 12.3% of young people um, live in relative poverty. So that's higher than for the age group of 26 to 65 years old. Uh, we're on average across the OECD, about 9.8% um, are living in um, um, relative poverty. And it is, it, it is indeed that the case that um, young people, when they are transitioning from education to work, when they're moving into uh, their financial or uh, independence from, from their parents, um, young people can indeed face uh, significant income volatility, right, because of their unstable um, uh, employment situation, whether or not they have, for example, temporary contracts, but also low paid jobs, they have a much higher risk of dismissal than, than older age groups. And in between, they can have periods of unemployment, where, um, of course, which generates, of course, a significant uh, volatility. Now, it does become problematic. Uh, so it's it's kind of normal, right? And and, and then the, there's, there's little, um, I mean, we can do something about it, but it's kind of normal that they face this income volatility. Now, it does become problematic when a young person cannot rely on financial support of different kinds, right? Either from their families or for their governments. And on top, often uh, young people have accumulated um, limited savings, savings that they can fall back onto, right? And the problem is that when you have poverty very early in, 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 in a person's career, that can actually have long lasting impact on uh, their lifetime uh, earnings prospect on their employment, because of course it's a vicious circle where it's difficult uh, to leave, um, uh, that is difficult to leave, right? Um, and so the extent to which uh, social protection uh, supports uh, young people varies a lot across countries. And so um, in, in the coming months, the OECD will uh, produce a policy paper <clears throat> on this topic where we compare how countries differ in the way they uh, support young people uh, through this uh, um, transition period, right? And we see that um, often, um, young, or, or not often, but sometimes, young people are not covered by uh, social protection just purely because of their age. In other countries, we see that they are protected, but that um, typically income replacement benefits are not sufficient to keep them out of poverty. And so other measures like, for example, housing or family benefits, but also health services or education support are actually needed to lift them out of poverty. That combined with um, employment services to help them find um, stable employment are often indispensable to promote uh, the self-sufficiency of uh, young people. Now, um, when we look, when we go back to the risk that matters survey that I've mentioned uh, earlier already, we see that uh, a lot of young people um, voice concerns over um, housing costs. So um, in, in this figure, I show you on uh, the vertical axis. So if you look at the, the vertical um, axis, we see that 71% of young people um, are worried about the cost of housing. So it's either uh, rent or mortgage payments. Um, and um, in, in, compare, when we compare that with uh, other age groups, it's much higher. So for young people, it's 71%. For the other age groups, it's uh, 65%. Uh, and so it's actually the most important issue, policy issue, that young people identify as the most concerning. 
Um, again, there are um, considerable variations uh, across countries. So if you look from, from the top to down, um, we see that um, concerns about housing are highest, again, in countries like uh, Spain, Mexico, Chile, um, and lowest in countries like, uh, for example, uh, Finland, where only 44% of young people are concerned about housing, compared to, for example, uh, in, in Chile and Mexico, where it's, it's close to uh, 90%, and Spain even higher. Now, we also, this, this figure also shows that these housing concerns are actually higher in countries where the share of young people living with their parents is higher. So that is shown by this blue line uh, in the figure. Um, and the figure also uh, so shows that this share of young people living with their parents is highest in countries like Korea, where it is lowest in country like Denmark. Um, and so it's, 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 it's really this, it's, uh, uh, I mean, the share of, of young people uh, living with their parents is a sign also about how important these housing costs are and, and, and the inability of young people to actually leave the parents' house uh, to go and uh, live on their own. And so a recent report uh, by the OECD that I've, I've put here a picture, <laughs> it's called Break by Break, shows that um, the decreasing affordability of housing across OECD countries um, actually has really very much contributed to this housing concerns, right? And so it's um, both real house prices and real rent, uh, rent prices have um, actually risen faster than uh, inflation over the past two decades. And that is actually eroding the housing uh, affordability. And so then if we turn to another OECD report, um, society at the glance is actually making the link between these housing costs and uh, fertility. And so this report, Society at the Glance 2024, features a special chapter on uh, fertility trends uh, across OECD countries. And so this report discusses um, the effect of labor market outcomes, housing costs, and other aspects of uh, family policy, um, uh, family policies on fertility trends. And so it also um, discusses um, some, uh, some of the key policy challenges arising from um, this, uh, from this, um, um, in, in this policy area. And so the report actually found a very clear negative association between fertility rates and um, the housing cost. Um, and, and, and also, not only that, but it's actually concerns about the cost of housing have become a barrier to either having children or having uh, more children. And so this, this report um, shows in a, in a very nice chart on uh, fertility that uh, <clears throat> OECD countries have been experiencing um, a long-term decline in total fertility rates since the 1960s. So that is shown by the diamonds and the triangles in um, these figures. And so the decline temporarily stopped during the 2000s, but then after the financial crisis of 2008, actually the, the decline continued. And so by 2022, which is shown in the, in the blue bars in uh, this figure, the total fertility rate <clears throat> across OECD countries has reached just 1.5 children uh, per woman. And so that, uh, that, that uh, fertility rate is well below what we call the replacement rate um, of 2.1 children per woman, uh, which is indicated by um, the black um, line, <clears throat> the black horizontal line in the middle of uh, the figure. And so looking at um, <clears throat> differences across uh, OECD countries, we see that the total fertility rate was highest in, um, in the OECD country, uh, member country uh, um, Israel, with uh, 2.9 children per woman, uh, followed by Mexico and France, where they have about 
1.8 children per woman. Now, on the other hand, the uh, total fertility rate was lowest in um, uh, Italy and Spain with 2.1, uh, sorry, 1.2 um, uh, children per woman, and then especially low in uh, Korea with only 0 0.7 children per woman in 2022. We also notice, or the report notice, um, that um, birds are increasingly occurring at later ages. So while <clears throat> the average was still uh, 28.5 um, age in uh, 2000, by 2022, the average age at which um, women are giving birth increased to 30.9. Um, and so, I mean, there's different reasons uh, for, for this um, delay in having children. On the one hand, um, there's a growing autonomy agency in family planning, et cetera, um, that, that influences this age. But it also uh, related to major social and economic developments that have changed the conditions for family formation and parenthood. And indeed, uh, issues like or um, uh, factors like the household income, how it is split between the parents, what is the cost of child care, uh, child care and housing, they can all affect um, whether people uh, decide to have children, whether they decide to have children, when to have them and how many um, to have them. And so, um, now, in the uh, next uh, um, or in the last couple of slides of, of my presentation, <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about um, the OECD recommendation on creating better opportunities for young people that we have uh, published in um, 2022. So this is um, this OECD recommendation is a legal instrument that uh, all countries, all OECD countries, member countries, have a day or two in 2022. And so that, um, that document, that, that instrument, it contains a series, uh, a long list of detailed policy recommendations in each of these uh, five policy areas. So we have um, recommendations on skills and competences, labor market uh, policies, uh, social outcomes, but also young people's trust in government and um, the administrative and technical capacities of governments to address age-based uh, inequalities. And so this recommendation, again, I've put, I've put the, the link on, on, on the slides so that you can take a look. This recommendation is actually a collaborative effort across different uh, OECD departments where we have um, we set together and elaborated uh, the different um, uh, policy recommendations. It's not only an effort from the OECD itself, but it is. it has been elaborated in very close collaboration with all country uh, governments um, across, across the different uh, policy areas, different ministries, and also uh, through extensive um, consultations with uh, young people who have um, given their voice to uh, uh, or their um, opinions uh, and input uh, for this OECD recommendation. Now, uh, when we look, I, I mean, here I list some of the examples uh, just to give you an idea of how um, the recommendation looked like. Of course, those who are <clears throat> interested to really take a close look at the recommendations, I invite you to take a look at the website. Um, but so, for example, for the um, recommendations on the transition into and within the labor market, we look at the different uh, elements like job creation, but also employment services and uh, entrepreneurship. And each of these uh, four points are then uh, further detailed in, in the recommendation. The same holds for our recommendations on social inclusion and uh, youth well-being. So we look at income support, how income support can be um, improved how tax systems and benefit policies can can be better aligned. Um, we also pay a lot of attention to housing, as uh, this is one of the key concerns, 
And of course, I've, I've not yet mentioned it so far in my presentation, but health, uh, health issues, mental health issues, and the well-being um, more generally, how can that uh, be, be improved, is also further uh, developed in, um, in our youth uh, recommendation. Now, this document is very much a legal document with, uh, I mean, a legal, yeah, a legal document with um, rec policy recommendations on what uh, countries can do. But then in the past um, year, we have been working on the OECD Youth Policy Toolkit, um, which is actually a collection of good practice examples from across our member countries. And so this OECD Policy Toolkit um, will be launched in November this year. It is a guide for policymakers, but also other youth uh, stakeholders um, with a, a long list of good practice examples. And again, this has been elaborated with uh, input from our member countries and through consultations with young people. And so this uh, toolkit will become available uh, online at, uh, towards the end of the year. Um, and it, it will be freely available for everybody um, who is interested to learn more about these um, policy examples. So, and um, with that, um, I have reached the end of my presentation. And, uh, well, in, of course, I share on this slide um, uh, our website and my email address, just in case you would like to get in touch with me. Uh, of course, I'm still here online if in case there's questions from the room. Uh, I would be happy to answer, to answer those. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Miranda. Uh, that's a uh, bunch of uh, very interesting slides and uh, very inspiring uh, things you talked about. Uh, now we have some time for questions. So uh, uh, if our audience here in person or online would like to ask a question, you're more than welcome. I would like to break the ice, if nobody does. Alex. Hi, Berle, how are you doing? I'm Alex Vasquez. We've been in contact lately. Thank you for accepting our invitation again. <laughs> and I had some questions, especially to relate the topic that we're going to uh, speak today and, and the following days. So the first one would be that if the OECD has some studies relating um, the migrant youth, either disaggregated data, access to housing, integration, employment, et cetera. And uh, since the other topic that we're gonna touch upon is gonna be aging or older persons, that group, if there's some studies, especially on this toolkit that I really like, I, I know that you and women uh, elaborated one for uh, gender policies. I would love to have something for family policies as well. And in this regard, there's this growing consensus on care. And all these, I mean, I saw the data that you showed us on people or young people staying at home with their parents. If they are taking on any care responsibilities, either to their parents, to the vulnerable in their homes, or even the older persons in this case. Thank you. Yes, a very, very interesting question indeed. So, um, well, I do not have the exact numbers uh, in, in my head, but we, we have been um, trying to look into why these young people um, stay at home. Uh, of course, it very much differs across countries, right? When, when, you, when we, we see, the, for example, the need rate in Turkey, where you have about 30% of young people, if you then look at it, it's mostly women um, who are uh, taking care of their children, their parents, their house. So there, of course, it's, it's uh, the, the largest group is actually young people who are caring uh, for, for their family uh, members. If you then look at um, countries where the need rate is much lower, like for example, the Netherlands, but also the, um, uh, Denmark, the Nordics, um, the, 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 the remaining group is, is often uh, young people with health issues, um, disability uh, issues who are unable to work. Um, it is also, of course, very much related to the issue you just mentioned, right? About an aging population um, where we need all our uh, 
uh, active uh, members of society to contribute to society, right? So these countries have been investing a lot in uh, trying to uh, activate, bring people, everybody who can work should be able to, to contribute, right? So, uh, so these countries have been investing a lot into bringing down youth unemployment, bringing down youth inactivity rates, and bringing them into the labor market. Um, and, and of course, then it depends on the country. And so here I'm entering in, in a policy topic that I know uh, much less about, about care, uh, providing care, right? Uh, so I have other colleagues who are much more uh, knowledgeable about that and can provide you all the data. Um, but, but yes, so the, the whole uh, care issue of caring for the older members of society does require much more labor uh, or workforce uh, and to, to be able to provide those services and whether it is through young people uh, entering the labor market or through migrant workers uh, who are entering the labor market and also those again like activating those who entered um, the labor market so that they they can all contribute to uh, our aging societies. Thank you. Any more questions? So, um, um, I may have the last one, just to <laughs> get on this review. Um, besides the good practices of this toolkit, do we have any, I mean, the toolkit will provide also kind of test of any policy implemented, how cost effective would be, uh, what groups, uh, so social groups are, are targeting, etc. I know because our usual aim on, on advocacy claim is uh, addressing the family and all its members is going to be much more cost effective than just one singular group. Yes, so we, um, so the, the, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not able yet to share any of these good practices. So you'll have to wait a, a few more months. But basically, what I can tell you is that the good practices have been selected um, uh, based on evaluation. So all good practices that we include are have been evaluated, have shown that they are um, uh, leading to positive effects. Um, for those where we have information on their cost benefit um, um, impact or um, their cost benefit uh, uh, measures, we have included. Uh, we uh, also very much focus on diversity among young people, right? Because of course, when we think about young people, it's not a homogeneous group. There's a lot of uh, variety, I mean, variety, uh, heterogeneity differences across young people. And so each of these um, policy examples focus on uh, different groups and especially on the more vulnerable groups on how we can really uh, help them um, and so uh, also there, each policy practice we've highlighted for which groups they could be particularly interested, uh, et cetera. Now, um, I also want to stress the fact, because it, it's in the big title of, of my presentation, we, we focus very much on how we can create better opportunities for young people. We try to avoid the word support because uh, that was very much a message from young people themselves. Like they don't want support, they want to be able to take the opportunities themselves. They want to create their opportunity. They want to play an active role and not just passively receiving support. So also that has been a bit of a red line um, through um, uh, the toolkit. How can we give young people the, the right opportunities? How can we help them to create the right opportunities? That kind of uh, the focus of this toolkit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miranda, uh, for your for sharing with us all the data, and we are looking forward to to the toolkit. For sure, we'll have a look on that. Thank you very much yeah. for inviting me.